Good morning. Welcome to the Natural Alternative Podcast, and I'm Madonna Guy. I'm here with Trish Nash today, psychologist and ah, friend you've never had that straight out of sleepless in Seattle, only joking. So I'm here with Trish Nash this morning. Uh, welcome, Trish. It's great to be here, Madonna. Thanks for having me. You are so welcome. I'd like you to introduce yourself. You've got quite a varied history. So please uh, tell the audience about yourself. Um, so my passion is um, women's mental health. So I have a psychology degree and I'm a um, certified counselor with the ACA. And I've also worked with disabilities and age care and children's services. So a broad spectrum throughout the whole life. But um, I really found that working with um, women and um, especially with mental health, um, women who are middle aged. So we go through um, our lives, taking care of our children and our husbands and jobs And we kind of get to middle life and we get an epiphany of, hmm, is this all there is? You know, have I been living authentically um, through my true self? And a lot of times we get a big no and um, we have that space where we can start to explore things um, with that. Um, But I do have a practice in Calbar called Healing Evolution Wellness Center. And that's where I do counseling treatments, um, chakra balancing, um, intuitive aromatherapy massage. And I'm also an aromatherapist, so I have um, a range of emotions blends and chakra balancing blends as well that I use in my treatments and with my counseling clients. I'm also an author, self-published author of two books, and that's based on emotional healing with the essential oils as well. So it's something that I love doing. Um, So I found my passion and I've just grabbed it with both hands and jumped in. Fabulous. So with the psychology and talking mental health, I keep hearing, especially women's health, I keep hearing that the rates of antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications have just gone through the roof in the last few years. Are you finding that with your clients, that people are getting stuck and just can't find their way out of uh, fear and anxiety these days? Um, Definitely, because it's that underlying current in our society right now that, I mean, pretty much everyone has low-level anxiety because of the uncertainty and a lot of the fear mongering that's that's happening and being perpetuated in our, our society. So it is um, quite a cha- quite challenging a lot of people right now. So, um, you know, different, I have different techniques that I can help um, people through that stress and anxiety. So when they're in that state, they can help calm themselves down. I use a lot of meditative techniques. Um, so I run a meditative meditation group as well, where it's a guided meditation and um it can help bring that anxiety down and through breathing. So it's, um yeah, it's, and suicides as well have skyrocketed during this time. And it's not really publicized um, with what's really happening within our, within our country and our world. In fact, it's, it's quite hidden, suicides, the last few years. It's very sad. Yeah, I mean, there's just major impacts with, you know, people losing jobs and livelihoods and, you know, that's a lot of stress and pressure on a family, you know, a husband or a mom, you know, not being able to feed their children or put a roof over their head. You know, it's major, major, major stressors plus isolation. I mean, we all know what's happening in the world. There's lots of factors that, um, you know, that are contributing this, you know, it's control of our finances. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty narcissistic. (laughs) It's quite phenomenal because it feels like if so much money can be spent on the things that we're seeing governments around the world and the globalists spending money on, there should be enough money for everyone to have a house and a home and a job and food and water on their tables. It doesn't feel like that's that far out of reach. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, talking about, you know, being having food and water, I mean, there's many professionals that have, you know, you know, take doctors, for instance, they go to school for, you know, each year and all the money and time they invested. And if they don't choose a certain, a certain path that's deemed by the government, then, um, you know, forget it. You've just lost your job, your livelihood, your education um, is worthless now. Yes. And maybe that's always been there for doctors to a certain extent, but it's never been more in our faces in the last two and a half years. You know, I've met 
I've met many doctors at this point who simply cannot practice anymore. Yeah, and other professionals as too. I mean, you know, nurses and aged care workers, disability. Yes. I mean, the list goes, it's you know, quite long. <laughs> yeah. So what are people coming to you with at the moment? So is it predominantly anxiety or is it a mixed bag of mental health issues? So obviously we've got the suicide on the side, you know, that um, God bless them, you know, uh, they've done the best they could in that moment. Um, yeah, so a lot of stress and anxiety. So like I was saying before, just uh, a lot of people are coming because they just feel really uneasy, uncertain, um, disconnected. So they're kind of just floundering around, not sure how to move forward in life because there is so much uncertainty. So, I mean, I really work with clients of, you know, well, what can you control? You know, can you control the war in Ukraine? Can you control Johnny Depp, you know? Can you control these certain things? By watching those, it can give you a lot of anxiety. It can really help, you know, layer on top more fear and anxiety. You know, so what actually, so one good tip is what actually can you control in your life? You know, so if you can't control it, don't focus on that. And then yes. another tip to help with the anxiety as well is, you know, stop looking at that stuff. You know, I was I going to say, turn your mainstream media off. Turn your devices off. I mean, not just mainstream media. So, I mean, you know, I've fallen into that trap in the beginning times where it's just you're following everything and looking at everything and reading and you're waking up in the morning and that's what you're clicking on. You know what I mean? Don't pick up your phone in the morning. You know, we kind of know what's going on. We don't need, I don't need five, five video videos to tell me about, you know, cloud seeding or five videos to tell me about pedophilia or 20 videos or 30 videos. Like there's a point where you kind of know the just of what's happening and, and you can be pulled into that, to that fear and that anxiety, because, you know, ultimately you want to survive your body, your mind, yes. your subconscious, it is, you need to survive. We don't care how you survive, but you, you know, our job is to, you know, to keep you alive. Exactly. So watching that stuff really puts you in that, that state. So you know, limiting, not, you know, being aware and researching and doing that, but just, you know, in a balanced way and, yes. you know, about, not worrying about what you can't control are two big things to help with anxiety. Yes. And it's, it's like the whole balanced diet thing. You've got to have a balanced, the amount of information going in, it's got to be a balance. You've got to get the good stuff in as well. And that's where meditation comes in. I was listening to Joe Dispenza yesterday gorgeous human being, and he was saying that 70% of us are living in survival. No, that's not what he said. He said most of us are living in survival 70% of the time. Yeah, I totally believe that. And it's been, like I said, within society, if you get, you know, everything is just fear, 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 fear. And, um, you know, and it's, it's really worked. I still see people walking around with, you know, a mask on. It's not even mandated and they're struggling to breathe and, you know what I mean? It's, it's And they're by themselves in the sunshine. Yeah, or in the car by themselves. Yeah. Like, enough research out there to tell you, well, you know, the mask doesn't work. You know, the virus is so small, it's going to go through that mask. You can only wear it for 20 minutes and throw it away. You know, there's lots of things out there that say, hey, this is actually unhealthy. You're not getting oxygen. Yeah. Um, fear is so deep-seated and it's, I think it goes into that isol um, isolating people from society. So, I mean, remember our brain operates on a reptilian primitive brain. You know, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to be ostracized from society. So a lot of people, you know, maybe inside they're like, oh, this is, this is bull. I don't really want to do this, but I don't want to be judged. I don't want someone to pull me up in the shop and tell me to put my mask on. I don't want to break the rules. Um, so they just go along with it. And that's where really knowing your true core values and your belief system can really support you. And I find, you know, we were you know, talking uh, earlier today about inner child work. And this is where really connecting to that inner child, to who you, you truly are deep down. And that can help you navigate during this time of, of staying strong to your beliefs and, and values and operating from that framework. So for those people who have never had inner child work or don't understand why that is so 
important if you want to get out of uh, back into your true authentic self. Can you discuss that a little bit? Um, yes, for sure. So um, I guess a small summary of inner child work. So it's connecting with that younger version of yourself. And it can be, you know, your two-year-old self or your seven-year-old self. So within our mind, we conjure up that image. For me, it's a little five-year-old in piggy tails and, you know, a little rough, <laughs> rough little girl running around barefoot. Um, so your inner child can be, be any age, but that's your true authentic self that we hide from. You know, we put on all these masks for the world and society, and we put this hat on. I'm a mom, you know, I'm a, an accountant, all these different hats. And, you know, they're just outside facades for the world. But when we tap into that, that little girl or that little boy inside of us, it helps us truly connect and we can help figure out our values. And we have generally through the age of one to five, you know, any traumas that we experience and we, we don't have the facilities, the capability to process that trauma. And when I say trauma, it doesn't have to be um, major trauma. It can be as little as, you know, um, oh, little Timmy, you're so stupid. And that can affect that child's self-worth. So it doesn't have to be a big trauma. So we take all of that on. And by doing that inner child work, we can actually help process that trauma from that younger version of ourselves. Um, so it's, it's, it's really fascinating fascinating work of how um, much we can reconnect by just, you know, looking at ourselves as, as a younger version and being able to forgive, you know, because a lot of times we, we beat ourselves up as well in those situations that, you know, no one was there to protect me or, you know, no one, you know, I'm, I'm a child, an adult is supposed to be taking care of me. So it's then taking that role as your adult self and connecting with your inner child and being there to say, you know, I'm here to support you. Yeah. You know, I forgive you. I did the best I could at the time. You know what I mean? And just helping with that acceptance. And then, and then it helps. So that's you as your adult self saying those things to you as your little person. Yeah. So you're basically comforting your inner child within you. And then you build that stronger bond of self-love. Um, so one thing when I, you, you know, looking at my inner child, because sometimes, you know, if you're very disconnected, you might visualize your inner child that, you know, five-year-old or seven-year-old, and you don't really have any feelings connected with them. Um, so one of the strategies I did when I first worked with inner child work is to connect, is I would visualize, you know, like just a two-year-old because I was in children's services. So I would just picture a little two-year-old with a big smile on their face, you know, toddling towards me, half falling over, just smiling and giggling. And that just brought up such feelings of warmth in my heart. Mm. It could be a, or your favorite, your dog that you love it just brings up those feelings of warmth. And then when you have those feelings in your heart, then you visualize that inner child within you. And then it, it associates your body associates that love um, with your inner child. So it's a great way if you're having trouble connecting, just you know, there's usually something all of us love, you know, an animal could even be a hot fudge someday. <laughs> I mean, it's, we're all individuals. So it's whatever really resonates with your heart. So if you're having trouble bringing that love, um, those feelings of love for yourself, um, cause it can be very challenging, um, to think of something else that you do have love for and then transferring that emotion over. Yeah. And when it comes down to it, every time we're angry with ourselves, every time we feel ashamed, every time we blame ourselves for something, every time we feel guilty, we're blaming a part of ourselves for something that's going on. And we always do the best we can with the knowledge we have at the time. Yeah, most certainly. Like that's a that's a huge thing. You know, what if or I should have did this or should have, could have, would have, you know, you'll drown yourself you know, being in that space. So it's really you know, connecting inward. Yeah. So with your little inner child, the meditations that you do, uh, that's with someone lying on it. So you work mostly one-on-one -on -one in your clinic or do you work mostly Zoom? How do you work? Um, so I do group meditations for the community and um, that can be multiple different things. It just depends on I don't really plan anything. It's just what I feel for the day. 
and um, we do those uh, meditations just at a community center in town. And then when I work with one-on-one -on -one clients, it depends on what they're working with that um, we can do that on Zoom um, or in person. And I guide them through their own inner child meditation. So I do it intuitively. Then also just ask a few questions um, so I can really cater that meditation for that person specifically. Um, so like for me, when I do inner child meditation for myself, I grew up with horses on a farm. Um, we picked blackberries and we had a woods. And um, so I just incorporate that with me and my inner child, um, you know, on horses together, holding hands and, you know, and I really, really explain and go in depth of all the senses as we're, we're going through that meditation. Wow. Yeah, that's really lovely that you make it so connected to that particular person. You know, you bring in their things into their meditation. Nice. Yeah. One is that one-on-one -on -one working with a client. Um, I make it very specific for them. And yeah. then I put the essential oils too. So 21 different emotions range, um, essential oil blend. So I incorporate that as well. It might be, you know, someone's really working on, you know, body images as well, you know, so I can, um, you know, use beautiful body or I love me, or if someone has a lot of, um, you know, pain in their hearts, you know, open your heart blend. So I have different blends to help support um, through that. So we, I guess the process would be, um, I would select which essential oils that I, I feel, and then they inhale those oils and apply them to their body, um, depending on, you know, if it's heart work, it's their heart, or if it's a lot of fear, it might be on um, their lower abdomen, their root chakra, and then um, guide them through that meditation. Mm. How lovely. You've been doing aromatherapy a long time. Like it's yeah. amazing that the science of aromatherapy is so beautiful and yet it's another one of the things that the Australian government has gone, nope, no longer health fund rebates, you know, 19 health fund rebates disappeared, drop of a hat. Yeah. It's I was four of them. <laughs> yeah, it's very unfortunate um, because they're such, like you said, it's scientifically proven the benefits that, um, aromatherapy has on the, the mind, the body, you know, and especially with anxiety, you know, I have a blend called wash away your worries. Oh, you know? nice. <laughs> yeah. And that's for fear. If you're feeling a lot of fear and I have a forgiveness blend, um, you know, to really help, you know, cause you can be out or you might hear something and it triggers those feelings and you can just pop that out. It's right there handy. You can apply it, inhale it. Um, so it's such a, you know, such a tool that's available to you straight away that you can um, apply to help get you through, you know, an anxiety attack, or if you're feeling really stressed out and just add a few breaths with that. Yes. You know, do that, apply the essential oil. Um, you know what I mean? I have the person hold both hands in front of their face and just take three deep breaths in, you know, an inhale and exhale. So it helps calm them down with the breath as the essential oil starts to work through their system and um, yeah, into their brain. So it's, it's pretty amazing. I love essential oils. They've been so helpful in my own life. I heard of a study recently that was about, I uh, can't remember, rats or mice, where a mouse was uh, injured or uh, traumatized where, and they had them smelling lavender. Have you heard that study? And then basically they had children and even seven generations down the track when the baby mice, so this was obviously the connection between a trauma and a smell, and seven generations later the children and generational would uh, go into trauma when they smelt lavender, which, of course, was simply showing that trauma comes down through our genes. Definitely. I'm a firm believer in that. So I'm glad there's a scientific study that uh, shows yeah. that. Yeah, we hold that trauma, generational trauma. We also hold a lot of trauma as females as well. Yes. With female trauma. Um, so when we work on any trauma, anything within ourselves, we don't just affect, you know, our lifetime or, you know, our genes. We affect generations, you know, past and future when we do work on ourselves. I know as, as women, a lot of times we, you know, don't want to spend the time or the money on healing ourselves, but, you know, we'll 
do anything for our children. Um, but really, if we work on ourselves and mirror what emotional healing looks like, our children will follow suit. Our children will heal from that. Yeah. So the thing you can do for your children is look inward and, and heal yourself and, and be that role model. So talk a little, because once again, I, I so many women do not consider themselves worthy of Hmm. Well, lots. You know, like like quite often by the time someone comes to see me, I'm probably the same as you. They're at such a spot in their life where they finally go, God, I'm going to put myself first this year. You know, so for the first time, something has triggered them to go, my health has been on a downward slide for 10 years. I've been running ragged for a long time. So they finally start, got to that spot where they're going to put themselves first. And I say to them, what is it that you do for yourself? And they can't come up with anything. A lot of the time, like it's a, and then they get the tears come to their eyes and go, and I go, well, what do you want to do? Well, no one's ever asked me that. Yeah. So the women trauma that you mentioned before, can you speak a little bit to that? You know, okay. especially from past lives, because I totally believe that as well. Yeah. Well, like you said, in that study showed it, we bring that trauma through our genes. So, I mean, it's those generational patterns as well that we just, you know, it could be victimhood or it could be poverty mentality. And I mean, we see that, you know, even if you don't believe in all of these things, you can see that, you know, generations of, you know, maybe welfare recipients, you know, you see that it's the same pattern because we teach our children, you know, from what, what's in, within our genes, what's within our, you know, what we learned from our parents. So we just keep passing that on and continuing, but, you know, the awesome news is we can stop that can make a difference we can make a change by um you know and through meditation that you know you have control more control of your thoughts so say you start to behave a certain way and because you're more mindful and you've trained your brain you can say well wait a minute that that's not my value that's not my belief well, i don't believe that about myself or the world and then we but can first make- they have to work out what their values and their beliefs are Yes. And that's what I help people do is yeah. work out the values and beliefs. And then also, you know, like you were saying, you know, what do you do for yourself? You know, that's where you're connecting again with your inner child. What did you love to do as a child? What did you find fun? Like I love swinging on the swing and just tipping my head back, you know, and these things are mostly free and we yes. can just, you know, we can even take our kids to the park or we can just go to the park and, you know, just be free and do those things. So <clears throat> have them write down a list, you know, what did you do? What did you do as a kid? Did you ride your bike? Did you, you know, what do you love to do? Did you eat ice cream? You know, then maybe you just go get yourself an ice cream cone, sit down in, on a swing and just eat it and let it run down your face. And, you know, who cares, you know? So those are the things that, you know, I help people with creating that list. And also another, another thing that I do when a client comes in there in that state is they have a hard time saying anything positive about themselves. Yeah. So say, you know, what's what's some of the positive attributes, you know, and they can't come up with anything. And, you know, and you can mention a few, um, but a tool that I um, I give them to take away is ask some trusted, like a trusted family member or a trusted friend, someone that, you know, you can really rely on their response is not going to be, you know, twisted or not from a dysfunctional relationship and ask them, you know, when they think of you, what do they think of? What attributes would they um, say about you? And it's really profound. They, you know, when they come back with that list of, you know, maybe um, a partner or a best friend, and they're saying all these amazing things, you know, they're like, wow, I, I never thought they thought of me that way. You know, am I this person? And that's where you help them connect and have those feelings of self-love and start to work on, um, you know, how they feel about themselves. Cause really, unless you start to value yourself, it's hard for someone to move forward. Yes. So that's a core of starting with, um, and, you know, building yourself up in my first book, you know, I have a, a chapter called filling your tank. (laughs) Very nice. Yes. You know, take a bath, uh, just, you know, take time to read it. If you love to read, you know, take that time. It can be 15 minutes. So we think, you know, self-care, it's all this time and it's going to take, you know, 
No, you can read a book for 15 minutes. You can listen to a podcast for 15 minutes, a 15 minute meditation. You can do a foot soak. Like there's so many different things. Give yourself a face mask. There's so many different things you can do in a small amount of time. And, you know, and how you'll, you'll just feel so much better because, you know, for me in my life, when my tank was empty, where I was a people pleaser and I was always giving, giving, giving to my own detriment, where I am a giver and I have a huge heart, but when you go that, you know, you start to feel used and, um, you know, it, it starts to come from not a very nice place in your heart. So by filling your tank and putting yourself first, then I know people are going to say, we can't put ourselves first. I'm a firm believer, putting yourself first and filling your tank and having those resources. Then you can actually give from that space of love on your heart where it's your true self. And that's what you want to do. Um, but it's not from a tainted, I have to, or I'm being, you know, taken advantage of. It's because you have those resources and you're built up to, to do that. It does make you wonder where that don't put yourself first comes from because it's the essence of if you don't put yourself first, you can't be the best foot forward for anyone in your world. Because if you don't put your yeah, if you don't put yourself first, you're not going to be the best version of yourself. You are going to be more resentful of the people who take your time. You are going to be more challenged in life situations. So, you know, just makes me tick over. I wonder where that came from and I wonder if they actually had uh, our best in their hearts when they said that, you know. I, I wonder as well, because I mean, when you're in a plane and the plane's going down, they, no oxygen, they say, put the mask on you first. You know, if you're trying to put the mask on the child or your partner or, <laughs> you know, well, they can't help you. So you're going to bloody pass out and die. So yes. You have to go first. That's pretty funny. I hadn't thought of that connection before. <laughs> I mean, that you don't care for other people and you leave your children to starve and oh forget them they don't need clean clothes it doesn't mean that at all yes I mean, there's time in the day that we can take that little bit of time that fills us up you know yes. how many of us roll the internet or unproductive things that haven't filled our tanks it's just made us more anxious that was yes. instead of doing that put the, put the phone down and step away from the phone <laughs> And yeah. You know, how, how resentful do we get of our devices when we pay attention to them all the time? And we might get that little bit of a dopamine hit if, uh, you know, if we get a positive. But how often does it just interrupt our dinner or a show we're watching to defrag or, you know, or our sleep? I say, take it away. It can't be in your bedroom. People leave it in their bedroom and they use it as, a, as an alarm clock. I go, get an alarm clock. Take your phone out of your bedroom. Definitely. Our phones are not allowed in our bedrooms. Nope. They're way out in the living room. They're nowhere near us. Yeah. Yeah. What other tips do you ask? Okay. So thinking again about women's mental health. So because women are the caretakers generally, and I know this is generalizing and I know, you know, the whole gender thing isn't really allowed to be discussed these days, but hey, you know, women are generally the caretakers in the household. And if they're bringing traumas from their childhood into their families, what sort of challenges do you see from that caretaker perspective? Well, we, we didn't then do the same patterns that our parents taught us and our you know, grandparents taught us. So, we so that unconscious patterning that we really don't even think about. So it's stuff we learn, but it's also that generational aspects. I mean, it can be very damaging, especially if you have a victim mentality. You know, how are your children going to move forward in life if they always feel like they're a victim? You know, oh, life, something's always done to me. You know, it's always, oh, life's so terrible. You know, how are they going to thrive and move forward and have relationships and follow their dreams and even bother to look at their own value systems um, with that. And, you know, as, as parents, we think, oh, you know, we, we love our children. We know give them a house, you know, food, we take them places, um, buy them clothes, all those things. But we don't necessarily think of the mental impact that we're having um, on our children. And I know when I left my, um, my ex-husband, you know, I, 
was quite low within myself. And I left because of my children, not for yes. me, but because of my children, I thought I have two young boys and what am I teaching them? You know, what am I teaching them that a relationship looks like? And that was a big, a big, big turning point for me. So to help stop those generational patterns, so I thought if, you know, if I stay with him and I'm teaching my boys that this, this is the exact relationship they will have. And I don't want that for them. I've done, you know, making sure they've had organic food and, you know, just, you know, extraordinary things you do for your children, but yes. that, well, what am I teaching them by just my experience of how I'm living my life? So to be able to break those patterns, like I said, is breaking them within yourself. And yeah. then that, you know, like I see with my, you know, younger son, especially because he was a, around more when I was writing my book, like he puts those things into practices, you know, what, what I've written in my book, because he was there when I was writing it and he even was proofreading it. I mean, I let him proofread it. So he would re get the message as well, but you know, exactly. he saw the strategies that I was doing and what I was working through. And now he uses life. And he thinks about those things. So it's helped him. So it's, I've broken generational patterns. So it can be done is whether you, you know, choose to do that. And, and, you know, for me, it's building up that self-worth because every single one of us, one of the core basic things is our self-worth. Yes. And it's sort of funny. I was just thinking about teenage boys. I remember I was treating a kid uh, probably 10, 15 years ago, and he had a, he had a maybe ODD, oppositional defiance disorder. I think was the label they gave him at the time. But honestly, if you met both the parents, the diagnosis means nothing. It was all about the parents and uh, really quite hideous. It was quite shocking watching the behaviour of the parents around him. But anyway, and I remembered one day because he was having such a hard time at school and I said, look, you know, when they're giving you a hard time, just close your eyes for a, for a moment Imagine them in the palm of your hand. You're bigger than them. They can't hurt you. Imagine that they're on a, a drawing on a piece of paper in the palm of your hand. Imagine just crumpling it up and throwing it into wind and then all your worries will disappear. This kid ended up in jail for five years. Obviously, he wasn't a kid then. And uh, when he saw me again when he was about 30, he said, you know what I kept doing in jail? He said, I just had to keep visualising them in the palm of my hand and being able to get rid of them. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so even, and you can imagine in jail, the whole, everything about jail is keeping him in anger and fear, everything. Yeah. You know, they basically, they don't feed them well. They don't look after them. They're cold half the time. They, you know, there's a whole bunch of horrible stuff that happens in jails. <laughs> Here in Australia, it might be better elsewhere in the world, but here in Australia, they certainly don't get looked after because it's a private corporation. It's all about profits. So it was very interesting hearing that from someone who had spent five and a half years in prison. And it just shows what an impact we can make on people's lives by just one small little thing, you know, even through this podcast. And that's why, you know, I love doing what I do because, you know, that one thing, that one thing that that person needed to hear that day, you know, can just help them get through so much. Like that would have just been a lifesaver for him in that five years um, in prison was being able to just hold on to that and hold on to, you know, your words of wisdom and that knowledge and help him get through such a rough time. So that's what, you know, I love, love yeah. what I, I'm assuming you do as well. I do. I do. I do. So what would, like with, uh, so do you have many men come and see you or, or are you predominantly a woman uh, work with women? Is that just who you attract, attract in your world? Um, that's mostly who I attract, but I do work with some men as well. So I've actually had an influx of a few men this last week um, coming into the meditation group and really wanting to start exploring, um, you know, through alternative means and not just. Um, you know, the Australian just, oh, have a beer, mate, you know, brush it off, just put it down inside that, you know, they are starting to look at, there are, you know, some different options and, and ways to connect in the community and talk about um, how you're feeling to help you process what's going on. So um, I'm predominantly women, but I do get some men. In yeah. My practice as well. and, and the same, you're finding the same challenges for men as for women. Yeah, a lot of anxiety and stress. Yeah. And anxiety is so prevalent, um, like I said, in society with everything that's going on. And it's, 
you know, they're creating it that way. It's so you, you know, oh, we can't come to Christmas because of this, or, you know, it's really pulling families apart, mothers and daughters, you know, it's just atrocious of what's, what's happening and having that fear of what's happening next and what's happening next. And can we do this? And what's the rules today? And the rules have changed and, um, you know, no one can keep up. So of course it's going to create this huge anxiety. Yes. Um, but that's, and, you know, we can look at things in life that happens as a positive or negative um, aspects of everything. So, you know, this is a positive thing in a sense, because it is helping people then, you know, reach for help, you know, so it's, you know, they're not reaching for help for what's just happened over the past few years. They've pushed down everything that's happened through their whole life, but this is help facilitating and giving them that space. And it's finally their, maybe their breaking point that, you know, I need to sort my stuff out. I need to really look at what's going on. So, I mean, anything can be a positive and negative. Um, so, you know, that's the positive aspect of, of what's happening, that people are actually reaching out and realizing that we do need community, we do need connection um, and, and getting help. So it's- Yeah. And for the first year or so, and, I, and I'm just sort of thinking about disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I've been a naturopath for 27 years. And initially I started putting posts up about what you can do to boost your natural immunity. And what a surprise, I kept getting- hit by, you know, um, censored. And I've had a whole bunch of stuff taken off YouTube for mentioning, you know, we have such a thing as natural immunity, how crazy. And it's been a, like, even from that perspective, I go, come on, <laughs> you, you're you the ones not talking science here. Like, and there's so much science when it comes to mental health. There's so much science when it comes to prayer and meditation and changing your belief systems and, aromatherapy there is so much research it can't be denied that looking after ourselves is good for our whole bodies for our immune systems for our ability to move forward happily positive you know it there's no denying it and yet it's denied every day of the week and twice on Sundays yeah because they want us to be just mindless zombies um, that are drugged up and just following their narrative and controlling us yeah i mean you choose differently and i choose differently i mean i'm a sovereign being i love myself you know i choose what happens to my body i choose you know how i let it affect it yes and con yeah and from that perspective from a conscious perspective it's just amazing uh when people say that they're forced into doing something oh well there are other choices there's you always might, choices. You might not like that, but there are other choices. Yes. Like I can't quit my job. I can't do this. I can't do that. <clears throat> you know, well, maybe you have two cars. Maybe you have a million dollar house, you know, downsize to a hundred thousand dollar or five hundred thousand dollar house and have one car. Yes. You know, you have choices. Um, might not be the best choices, um, but then is again, you can look at it as the positive. Well, this is going to teach me to be more resilient. This will teach me to be more thrifty. This will give me more time with the children. This will help me, you know what I mean? Eat healthier because I'm making just wholesome food and not getting so much takeout because I'm tired from work. I'll save money on that. So everything like you're saying, you know, when, you know, I, that's a kind of a pet peeve of mine when people say, I don't have a choice. We do have a choice. The, yes. the outcome might, you know, might not be appealing to you, but you can look at it as a negative or like I just showed, you know, a few sentences ago. Well, there can be many positive things out of that as well. Mm. And what a beautiful way to look at it. And you would, of course, know about the studies to do with gratitude, where they did, uh, I think it was a month, they did a gratitude journal daily for a month and their happiness score was higher for six months afterwards. Yeah, don't ever underestimate gratitude. So that's part of my morning routine. So before I even get out of bed in the morning, um, I tap into universal energy and I let that flow through my whole body to heal me. And so once again, how do you do that? So once it, that might be whoop, over someone's head, how do you do that, Trish? I'm a Reiki master, so it's quite easy to tap yes. into energy. Um, so for me, I just, you know, visualize that I have that energy starts to come in through the bottom of my feet 
and starts to move up my legs. And it's becoming mindful. Like if your mind is all chatty, 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 you're going to have a really hard time focusing on that. So again, that's where meditation comes into play. If you're used to having a silent mind, then you can focus on that. So I just visualize that energy starts to move up the bottom of my feet, starts to come in the top of my head, and then it converges on my heart. And then it spreads out through my whole body. And then I just become a bubble of white love and light. And I practice that a lot within my meditation as well. So, you know, it's a skill. It is hard for someone to just, if they've never really connected or tapped into, you know, the energy of the universe or the energy within themselves, um, you know, can be very challenging. And, you know, three seconds in their mind's going to start wondering about what they're going to have for breakfast. Yes. Um, you know, that's where, you know, even that ties back into the inner child work because you're connecting with yourself, you're tapping in, you know, you're feeling those energies because you're actually in your body, you're in that present moment, you're, you won't be able to feel it if your mind is the past or the future or what's happening. So really connecting in and just, you know, your breath can help with that as well. Just concentrate on your breath and that energy moving inward and um, expanding out through your body. But for me personally, it always um, goes into my heart area first and then it spreads out. So even when I'm doing Reiki, um, um, cause I'm a Reiki master, I do the same technique. I just draw that energy from the bottom of my feet and the top of my head, it converges in my heart and then just expands out to my hands. Mm, beautiful. But you obviously have that as a script. In, I mean, I know it's non-scripted, but that's obviously something you can easily come up with. Obviously, you do it every day. So someone uh, who does have a bit of a monkey mind and who is just trying to shut down their brain, and it's like, don't think of monkeys, don't think of monkeys, you're going to think of monkeys. So by I sort of, there's also that you've got to allow the thoughts to come and go and just sort of focus on something, focus on something, whether or not, yeah, whether it is just your breath, breathing in, breathing out filling your body with light and love, allowing the negative to be released, allowing the positive to come in so that it's something nice and simple initially that uh, they can do that they feel comfortable and confident doing so the monkeys can disappear or they can come and they can go. <laughs> come and go. Um, yeah. But yet doing it through the breath um, can really help, like you're saying, inhaling, you know, that energy, you know, and you can exhale that energy as well to the world. So that's, um, you know, and it's all about, um, you know, giving back as well. So, you know, when you're creating that energy within yourself and then expanding that out, um, you know, to family or friends, or just even to people that you don't know, just expanding that, um, that out, that caring and that giving mm -hmm. um, it really as well. And then the second thing I do is gratitude that you were talking about earlier. Fabulous. Um, and it's easy to, you know, like for me, one of my first things is my pillow. I love my pillow. I think if <laughs> I had a hard floor on a rock, you know, so, you know, my pillow comes into play a lot for gratitude, but I also think of one thing that I'm grateful for that was challenging. So maybe it was, um, you know, an interaction that I had with someone or someone, that, something that you might perceive was negative um, in your, that happened in your life. I look at the, um, what I can be grateful for, what that taught me, what that enabled me to, to rise up to and become, did it help me become more resilient? Did it help me look at my own ego? So with gratitude, um, I always try to find something in the day that was challenging for me that I can look at differently. But if you're just starting out, you know, gratitude for the pillow, gratitude for, you know, breathing, or water, um, it's a good place to start for a beginner, but as you more advance in your practice, um, looking at that gratitude and everything in your life. Yeah. And there are a lot of, there's a, yeah, there's so much information out there about these things, isn't there? It's quite phenomenal. And even hugging, you know, good old hugging, you know, is so powerful for us. I mean, not that most people hug for 30 seconds, but I remember once again at the beginning of the last few years was uh, Dr. Zach Bush was talking about, and I love him, love him to bits, and he was saying that a 30-second hug increases your ability to fight viruses by 30%. Oh, wow. Because we're sharing each other's biome. 
We're sharing each other's microbiome. We're building our natural immunity by our hugs and community. So, I, yeah. So good on hugging and shaking hands. You know, we need to be connected with human beings. And that's why I love your meditation groups that you do as well. It's that touch. So, um, yeah, I'm a firm believer in the hugs. So I'll hug someone until I can feel our hearts connect. And I even say, do you, did you feel that? Do you, do you feel that? So the hearts connect. I've never timed it um, of how long it takes, but um, yeah, it could be even 10 seconds that, you know, that person you connect, your hearts just connect. You can feel it. Beautiful. And in the same way, because I'm a kinesiologist as well, I know that when you say, hold your hand, you know, the emotional stress release points are here. So just by holding your hand to your forehead, you're going to be bringing blood supply to the frontal cortex so you can think more easily. By going heart to heart with a hug, uh, you're going to be increasing that energy to your heart chakra, your heart energy, and there's a lot of neurons in the heart, isn't there? I think at la- you know, about 20 years ago I heard that it was about uh, 20% of the heart that were actually was more like brain neurons, but now they're estimating that it's up to 50% of the heart is more like brain neurons. So we really do feel and think with our heart. (laughs) Say that again. The brain. Yeah. Yeah, just the the simple, simple, simple things that, um, you know, just making that connection with another human being. And we all, like I said, I was a Reiki master, but we're all capable of it. I'm not special that I can, you know, do that. And, you know, we automatically or intuitively do that. We have a headache. Where do we do? Yeah, exactly. Or we get a we get a stressful phone call. We go, oh my, you know, we go, oh my lord, uh, you know. So we do these things automatically, or we sit down and we sort of hug ourselves because we know we need a hug. We go, yeah. There are so many self techniques that we use intuitively. We know these things. I mean, there's been many, 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 many generations before you know pharmaceuticals came in that we, you know, just use these techniques because we, we know how that, that makes us feel because we were more connected. Everything in our society now is disconnect, disconnect, disconnect. Um, yeah. And you know, bringing these simple things back to help you reconnect with who you are, your inner child, um, even hugging yourself and visualizing your inner child. You know, it's, it's such simple strategies, um, but the person has to be willing and ready, you know, like, I can't help anybody who, um, you know, if they don't want to move forward, if they don't want to open up their hearts, um, if they don't want to truly look at themselves, the light and the dark aspects, you know, you, you can't help that person. And I'm, you know, you would in all of your fields as well, unless that yeah. person is, you know, we're just facilitating the healing. That's right. There's an old thing in natural therapies. Uh, every condition can be healed, but every person can't. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, when, like saying, when the person first comes, it's helping build them up. You know, you want them to succeed. You know, they, they are looking, you know, giving them all the tools and strategies um, to help them connect with themselves and find that love, you know, so they do feel worthy enough to, you know, want to make a difference in their life. So, I mean, we definitely set people up for success. Yes. But, um, and I think people need to remember empathy these days. The last, well, once again, it hasn't just been the last two and a half years, but it's like people have lost the space in the last couple of years because we've been told by the powers that be that it's okay to pick on people about all sorts of things that they are choosing in their world. It's like that space that we have between our thought, like just say that you were someone who believed that everyone should wear a mask 100% of the time and I'm someone who believes the opposite of that. In the past, my brain might have gone, no, 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 Trish is entitled to her beliefs. I, I won't say anything. But these days it's like that moment is gone. People just say and blurt what they believe because they are feeling entitled to be able to be on the winning team, <laughs> whichever team that is. And so I think we all need a lot more empathy. We need a lot more love. We need a lot more care just connecting with the people around us because there's going to need to be a lot of healing moving yeah, forwards a lot of community and that's why i do the community meditation group is that it is a forum that we can all come together and connect and we even stay after a bit and have a chat and it 
It might be about meditation, but sometimes it does go to a little bit of what's happening in the world or, you know, it's only, you know, an extra 15, 20 minutes. So we're not going super in depth. Yeah. Um, it's giving that format to be like, you know, oh, all of my family's feeling this way, but I'm feeling this way. And, you know, it just gives them that space to even just say it out loud, um, which can be really beneficial and, and feel supported. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Trish. It's been wonderful having you today. I'm loving your little lights in the background, just gorgeous. Uh, any like yeah, just beautiful. So this is your little healing space. Yes, I do um, counseling and, and treatments here as well. And I do some workshops. And once yeah. again, can you please give your, uh, how, how can people find you? Um, so my business is Healing Evolution and it's .com.au. Okay. So my website, and I'm also on social media as well, Healing Evolution Info, I think, and I'm on Instagram. So, I don't And know. do you prefer emails? Do you prefer a phone call? Do you prefer? Um, I don't mind either way is how that person wants to communicate. Okay, so um, what's your email? Um, so my email is healingevolutioninfo at gmail.com. And your phone number? Um, it's 0487-835958. Absolutely spectacular. Thank you so much for sharing your peace and love and knowledge today. Well, thank you as well. Okay. Talk to you again soon, Trish. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.